tire out the children, let them run around, bring the little cupcakes as my dad did when I was kids. So I have a long way to go. I have an affinity for this place. And in my prior life, I used to be a newspaper reporter. And I covered a lot of different things. I wrote columns every week. And one day I saw the auction of old newspapers. And in it, I knew there was a first-hand report of somebody who wrote, wrote with Pulaski in Washington here at Brandywine. So I did, and I won that report. And I was so happy, and I was going to write a column on the Battle of Brandywine and, and you know, my great find. And I went to the local bookstore, it's just kind of book company, because I knew a lot uh, about Brandywine, but not I wasn't an expert or anything. And I said, give me a book on the Battle of the Brandywine. And they said, no such book existed. I was really surprised, because where you are today was the largest land battle of the whole war. There's about 30,000 troops when you combine both sides and we're really here during September the 11th. And the battle did take place on September 11th. It doubled the size of Chester County that day. You know, great devastation to this community. It took years for the farms and everything to recover from the two armies going through here. Uh, Lafayette's first battle. He was wounded just uh, a little bit away northeast from where we are today. George Washington, there, there's a great story, and a lot of people believe he almost died here. We'll talk about it. Think about how our nation's history would have changed if indeed Washington would have died here. The whole American Revolution almost ended here. If you read a couple of the British Army officers' um, memoirs and journals, they said if they had two more hours of daylight, there probably wouldn't have been a George Washington's army left to fight and go to Valley Forge. Very, very important part of American history right here. As I said, there was really nothing written about it. So that started about a six-year journey for me doing research to, to write this book. Uh, and when I started, there, there was nothing around. Uh, not many papers gathered, reports, letters, whatever. So it was very much a digging in a mystery and a puzzles and, and to get this information put together. Uh, I actually spent a couple weeks in Great Britain going to their public records office like our National Archives and also the British Army Museum to try to figure out what they said and the information they had on what happened here at Brandywine. I did research right here in this building on the information they had. Chester County Historical Society, the Pennsylvania Historical Society, up in Harrisburg, uh, a lot of different places to really pull this information together. I actually was here on September the 11th, 2001, doing research when, you know, the, sadly, what we also know about September the 11th, and we kind of know about in our recent memories. So that is how the book really kind of the idea came about. I thought there was one that was needed, the information wasn't there, and I started out to do the research. I was a newspaper reporter, I covered the courthouse a lot, and immediately I think some of those skills really helped out. Because I thought, where should I start to do the research? And I thought, John Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice of the United States. And at the time, if you were here in the park, they said that John Marshall was here, he fought here, and he was wounded here. I thought, wow, what a great way to start, because here was a person of, who wrote about it, a lot of information wrote about him. I thought I could actually start it out, and that's what I did. I looked at his papers. I read what he wrote about being at Brandywine. He was a captain. He fought in the Light Infantry, Maxwell's Light Infantry. He was involved in, in the first part of the battle from Kenneth Square coming to where we are here today. So he definitely was here and he fought, but nowhere did it say that he was wounded. 
And I always thought, you know, when he was up there at the Supreme Court, could he tell the weather? Did his arm hurt? Did his leg hurt? And I couldn't find anybody to verify that he was wounded here, but it said, it said so here. And it really kind of baffled me. And I was at the Chester County Historical Society, and I found a journal from Lieutenant McMichael. And in it, the journal said, on September 11th, the morning, my Captain John Marshall was wounded. That's where the reference came from. But you know, it still didn't make any sense to me. Why didn't he write about it? Why didn't anybody else know about it? And I finally figured it out. And what it was, on the same part of the field, two Captain John Marshalls. And it was the I, how I found it out. I went to Lieutenant McMichael's regiment. I found the roster in Harrisburg. And his captain was John Marshall from Pennsylvania. So it was actually the Pennsylvania John Marshall was wounded and not the Virginia John Marshall was wounded. So it's, a, you know, it's kind of that lesson when you do the research that you've got to be careful, kind of puzzle it through. Sometimes things aren't really as they, they, they seem to be. Um, Marshall did talk about it. John Marshall's father actually fought here too with the uh, one of the Virginia, I think it was the 3rd Virginia Regiment. And if you go to the Birmingham Meeting House, where the British on that afternoon came off of Osborne Hill, it was one of the units that kind of slowed down the British as they were coming across. So Marshall was here. Second, you know, kind of thing that I kind of looked into was the new American flag, which is the Betsy Ross flag. I won't say if Betsy actually made the flag, but you know it's still up for the debate. But the, it was introduced to George Washington's troops um, earlier that summer, just a few months before the Battle of Brandywine. And as I was doing research, if you go to Cooch's Bridge in Delaware, there's a little monument, and that was the engagement right before Brandywine. It said that on this spot, we believe that the American flag first came under fire. So I started doing some research. And again, you know, nothing's always that simple when you do research and you get into the history. And I kind of looked at how they kind of came to that conclusion. Washington got the flags right before, in August, first engagement was Cooch's Bridge. Therefore, that's when it came under fire. But then I kind of looked and I said, well, was George Washington at Cooch's Bridge? Now, he was there a little bit before and kind of left. He was actually scouting the best place to defend Philadelphia, and that indeed was here at Brandywine. Um, Maxwell's Light Infantry was there. Did he have a flag? Because there was only several of them. You know, you know, Betsy didn't go to Target and get a couple of gross and hand them out. <laughs> There was only a couple of the headquarters flag and given them out. And I tried to find somebody to write about it who said the flag was at Cooch's Bridge. Couldn't really find anybody to verify it. And I said, well, you know, if we can't quite verify it, you know, say maybe it was at Brandywine. But one more thing, I went to one of the historians down in Delaware and asked about it, you know, what's the proof? And he couldn't come up with any either. He said, you know, it was just kind of a... Um, you know, this happened, this happened, so that's where the flag was. So I thought, well, let's go see if it was at Brandywine. And again, I looked for somebody to write about it. And there was a reference from Re uh, Reverend Jacob Trout the night before when he was talking to American troops that indeed that the American flag was here. Was Washington here? Yes, so I'm pretty sure the flag came under fire here. And there's a really good chance that the first time was right here at Brandywine. Talked a little bit about George Washington. And, you know, did he almost die here? And when I do, do the research, in my books, by the way, I really like the people stories because it's what you all do and I do that really makes the history. You need the time and the dates to put it kind of all in context. But I, I really think it's what we do that really makes the history. And of course, George Washington, the leader, first president, general, kept us, uh, the American army going through the whole revolution, very important. And did he almost die here? 
This all revolves around a Captain Ferguson from the British Army, and I think was I think the replica of the Ferguson rifle is still sitting there on the wall. I should have checked before I looked in. Yeah, there it is. That's a replica. I've actually seen the real one. But that's a replica. But Ferguson, known as a crack shot in the British Army, a couple years before, he invented the British version of a breech-loading rifle. It was modeled off a French hunting gun that was a breech-loading. He was a crack shot. He showed it off to the King of England. Fine demonstration worked perfectly. The King said, why don't you make a hundred and some of the of them and go pick your best people and go to America and try them out in those rebels. See if it works against them. And that's what he did. He landed in America um, before the British left New York City and started a campaign that included Brandywine. And on that morning of September the 11th, he was in the cross, the vanguard, of the one British half of the army that started that morning in Kenneth Square to drive the Americans back to the Brandywine as Hal did a flanking movement. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But as Ferguson, the Ferguson Rifles and the Queen Rangers were in front, made it to the Brandywine that morning, Ferguson writes, and the incident really took place. The, 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 disagreement whether Washington was the officer involved, but Ferguson said he saw two American officers come in front of him real quick, went out of sight, then the one came back, and he said it was within his rifle range. He said he could have put three bullets in that officer before he got in the way. He had two of his riflemen next to him were ready to shoot that officer, and he stopped it. And it's something that you know probably wouldn't happen later in the war, certainly wouldn't do today. And basically what Washington, what Ferguson said, there was that brave officer doing his duty, we're not gonna shoot him. Back in the beginning of the American Revolution, that a lot of the British officers, including both the Howe brothers, thought we'd all come to our senses at some point and remain loyal to the king. So there was still, kind of the rules of conduct that didn't uh, go away to later take place, so that he was not shot. A little bit later in the morning, Ferguson himself was shot in the right elbow, and kind of destroyed his right arm. Later, he did recuperate and learned how to do almost everything as well with his left hand as his right hand. He came back, he led the British troops, he was at King's Mountain, and he died at King's Mountain. And if you go to King's Mountain, you can see where he's buried there. But the next day after the battle, on September the 12th, he was in a hospital. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy and a little not documented. <coughs> Ferguson's telling this story about this brave American describing him, the horse he's wearing, the uniform he's wearing. And supposedly there was a captured American officer there, and again, we don't know his name, who said, do you know who you had in your sights? It was George Washington. And indeed, if that was true, and if he would have pulled that trigger, Again, what difference would this country's history would have been? There are people who are experts on uniforms and everything that will argue back and forth whether it is Washington or another high-ranking American. It was definitely an American officer. But if you read the description of the horse, it sure sounds like it was Washington. It was the same color horse and everything in Washington was right. But again, you know, that happened right here. You know, you have almost, except for that hill, see where all of this happened back on September the 11th, 1777. Um, Squire Cheney is another one of my favorite kind of people in history. Squire Cheney was one of the original American patriots. Really, you know, wanted to have freedom, wanted to, you know, get rid of the king, have our own government, very vocal about it. And when the British were landing at the head of the elk, they, some family friends told Squire to go ahead and you ought to you know, go hide and get out of the way because the British catch you, you know you're on their blacklist. But he wouldn't do that. Again, how that history, and I'll tell you if I'm not sure and I can't figure out exactly what it was, 
and, and there's some discrepancies even in the family Cheney history that I've seen at the Historical Society. But early in that morning, he either started from home, where it's now in Delaware County, or he was in Marshallton at the inn there with a Colonel Hannum. And if you're from this area, you've probably heard of the Hannum family. Um, that were big in the horse country, and Judge Hannum used to be a federal court judge, and big in the area. That was their ancestor, and they were supposed and they were related. And early that morning, they get up at Marshallton, at Martin's Tavern, get out, and soon they see the flanking British Army. And Colonel Hannum were back to his unit. Squire Cheney said, you know, what's going on here? Where's the Washington's forces? And he ran, rode to inform them some shots were fired. And he got first to uh, General Sullivan, who had the right flank of the American Army, and said, we got British coming in on your flank. And Sullivan said, we had, you know, we had professionals out there. Nobody's reported that. You're crazy. And Cheney said, take me to Washington. And he did and said the same thing to Washington. And Washington looked at him and said, Sir, do you know what the penalty is for being a spy? You know, we're gonna kill you. He said, I'm not a spy, I'm a patriot. And as they were arguing back and forth, indeed, the word came that he was being outflanked and the whole Washington army was in jeopardy. You know, there, there are this, again, the people stories that really like and, and, and really grabs me about history. So yeah, I promised a little bit of overview of how we got to Brandywine and how everything unfolded. So uh, I'll do that part next. Really got to go back almost a year. Uh, George Washington lost a number of battles as general. And if you go back to 76, it looked like the American army was ready to dis disintegrate and kind of fall apart. And the British thought we are going to need a plan for, 19, for the 1777 campaign. So Howe went back to Lord Germain back in England looking for approval, saying, look, we're pretty disorganized. Why don't we split up our force? We'll take half of it to go up towards Canada, come down through New England. We'll capture Philadelphia, and the war will be over. Then Howe had a little bit of second thoughts. You know, around Christmas and crossing the Delaware, where we caught the Hessians off guard, and it was a big American victory, exactly what we needed to keep the country together and keep the army together. And Hal had second thoughts, so he wrote back to Germain again. And he said, You know, maybe we ought to rethink this, and maybe instead of splitting it up, maybe we ought to keep it together, go up north, and just roll south. And we'll have a strong unit, and we'll, we'll win the war that way. And he sent off that set of instructions. The only answer that Howe had back by the time of summer 1777 was approval for the first plan. Split the troops, Burgoyne goes north, and Howe takes Philadelphia. That's what was in place. So that's what he executed. He didn't decide it, and he was under orders from this ball that's supposed to do, that's what he was going to do. So Burgoyne was up north, he started putting all of his people together, a vast armada, some people say the biggest armada at that time, New York City. George Washington and his troops didn't quite know what Howe was going to do, but he had spies there. He knew something was going to happen. He knew that there was going to be a great invasion someplace. And part of it, they were making stalls on the ships for the horses so they would have places to be transported. 1770, you know, in July, they all get on the ships. Supposed to have been not quite a, as long as they, they ride as, as it ended up. They all get on, and if you read the Hessian diaries, or the tra I can't read German, but I read the translation by uh, Professor Bourgoin from the University of Delaware. And some of those Hessians said, they were told where they were going, and they thought, what are we doing? We all should be going up north to Burgoyne. But how did this clue really anybody in where they were going outside Admiral Howe's brothers and a few others? So when the 
troops left New York Harbor. Maybe they're going to go up to Burgoyne. And they didn't really hear anything until they almost came up to Delaware. But Admiral Howitt said Philadelphia's too well defended. You had Fort Mifflin there, you had it well blocked. You lose too many. And that's when he went back out and came up to the Chesapeake to the head of the elk and, and got off. I'm giving the shortened version. <laughs> you see me kind of think, I'm thinking, what can I add? You know, we'll take questions later and I'll be around. So they were, they were back, and it, it was really an awful voyage. It was hot, it was stormy. Um, one of the things that really kind of rang through, and again, I really like the people stories, and when you can really bring that history down to personal terms, there was a, a journal entry by one of the Hessians that said, today my bunkman died. I'm so glad he did. Why he was glad? Because he was sick and he was afraid he was going to infect everybody else around him. And, you know, it was just kind of that horrible. And because they weren't supposed to be out that long. And, and um, there was a Senator Bell from Delaware, Pennsylvania Senator, who always told the story when he was in Harrisburg about the storms being so bad that one of the British ships were blown so far off course, they ended up in London. <laughs> It was a pretty bad storm, I'm not sure if maybe they just got blown off and kept on going, I don't know, but it was really kind of bad storms out there. They end up at the head of the elk, basically elk and today. They, they get off, and the first thing that really hurt the British Army was that the horses started dying as soon as they get off. They ate too much, they had cholera, they had to replenish the horses because of the voyage. And they decided to pay pretty good money. And if you wanted to sell the British your, your horses, you could make a you know, pretty good fair amount. And apparently it was so good that some of the American officers sold their horses to the British. I saw reports of that in some of Washington papers that they were worried about that. And that had, they, 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 when they got off the boat, the boat the boats, the ships, they didn't really have much opposition. That there was a little bit of militia, uh, militia around, there was some firing, not much, but pretty much they were unopposed when they get off. And it's pretty, you know, just kind of keep in mind back then, and I think we all think now, every American was for freedom, right? We all wanted to be free from the King of England? Not quite. You're right. You know, some people say it's a third, third, and third, some say, and I'm sure it's not quite a third and third, but there was a lot of us who wanted to stay royal to King George, a lot of us wanted our freedom, and the other ones just wanted to be left alone and live. So you had that, and you had the Quakers, of course, in the middle that were not going to take sides on either side. But of course, George Washington thought that the Quakers were too much, front, too friendly with the British, and the British thought the Quakers were too friendly with the Americans, so they got it from both sides. One of my favorite stories about George Washington was that when the British were getting close to a mill where they could use to you know, grind grain and make, you know, make foodstuffs, that he would go in and take the grindstone away so the British couldn't use that mill. And after the British left, they would give the millstone back, unless you were a Quaker, then you didn't get it back. Because he, you know, kind of punished kind of the Quakers, or was, he thought were aiding the British a little bit too much. So you had kind of a mix that some people were for freedom, some wanted to stay loyal, and some just wanted everything to go away as you're coming up. Uh, they were George Washington wanted to stop, of course, his main north, basically up around Lafayette, and if you have those protected, there's no way the British is going to get around you and outflank you. So that's how he set the defense. They had General Sullivan all the way up on the north, and they were ready. Now the British had a little bit better American help. They had a Tory from West Callan Township outside of Downingtown, really knew this area. And he said, I can get you around them. And indeed he did. So early in that morning of September 11th, oh, the British 
kind of all congregated there in Kennedy Square that night. And Hal wanted to attack almost immediately, and his officers, look, you've been on a long march, give the men a chance to rest. Then under the breath, they said, then we can go to the taverns and have a good night for the morning. And apparently that, indeed, some of them went to the taverns that night. But the next morning before daybreak, Hal took a little bit more than half the British troops and starting a flanking movement with that Tory that was going to lead him around. It was hot, you had, you had some fog, so the Washington's troops out there doing the reconnaissance couldn't really see it. Every time Hal came to a farmer out in the fields, they were taken into custody so they couldn't give an alarm. They weren't harmed or anything, but they weren't going to allow them to tell Washington's troops out there that the British were on the move. And they started that 14-mile march that went over two fords, and early in the afternoon, they ended up on Hot Osborne's Hill, which is basically where Rattling Run Country Club is today. And that's where they, re they reformed. The other half of the army, a little bit less, was under General Knighthausen, the Hessian, and his orders were drive the Americans in front of you, back to the Brandywine, demonstrate like you have the whole army there with you, and when you hear us attack in front and back, you come across the Brandywine, we'll catch them in the middle. That was basically the plan. Knighthausen did what he was supposed to, came down, set up the artillery, basically where the, the school is, and they were firing back and forth. Washington was getting reports back from his scouts out there. And there, there's been some people say that you know, there were spies from the British giving reports back to Washington. I really don't think so. I think what was happening, it was getting these reports back, and they weren't really dated in, in the place specific. So, you know, he'd get one report, don't see any British. Next one was said we saw some, the next one we didn't. We didn't know where exactly these reports and what times that they were seen. So he was getting some information they really couldn't put together at one time. And I, I don't think it was anything you know done on purpose. It was just the way that it was coming back. Matter of fact, one time in the early afternoon, he thought that indeed Howe had tried a flanking, that he had just a small portion of the British Army, which was in front of him, and he ordered an attack across the Brandywine. Then had second thoughts, he said, well, maybe Hal's not that far away, he just wants us out of our defense, and then we get crushed on the other side of the river. So he pulled him back. In the afternoon, you had Hal's army forming up on Osborne Hill. And, and again, it's how you say some things in history that sometimes give different meanings. you got to look. I, I've heard people say that you know, the British were so arrogant that they stopped and had tea before they attacked the Americans. Pretty arrogant, huh? Well, if you really look at it, if you were marching for 14 hours, you got 5,000 troops. You've done the walk, so you know. <laughs> you probably stopped and had tea up on Osborne, too. Yeah. You, you know, you're out there the walk, and you have maybe you know an hour before everybody forms up. Aren't you going to have get something to eat also? <laughs> It's not so much arrogance, it was just, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to use this sign for good and have the tea. So, as they were forming up, that's when Squire Cheney was coming down to try to give the, the head warning. And, and sure enough, while Cheney was there, the word came in that indeed the British were up on Osborne Hill. And there's so many different people wrote about that site that day with the troops up on the hill and the different colored British uniforms and then with the band and just kind of marching off you, you can almost visualize kind of coming down and, and the attack took place. They did have one of their uh, units on the far right get lost in the woods. Sounds like a bad thing? No, <laughs> good thing, for, if you were British. Uh, as they came down, the order came across that Sullivan was supposed to pull his troops up. General Wayne was supposed to take care of the defenses right out here. And that's when the firing and the crossing started to take place. Sullivan's troops never got in line up on Battle Hill. 
The British pushed them off. That's when Lafayette left from this area and went up to try to help. That's when Nathaniel Green, fighting Quaker, went up and really helped save the, the Americans up there. Uh, General Whedon, it's, it's nice to go around these roads because you can see the signs, different generals and people, names that are connected with this. It ended up that the Americans were pushed off, pushed back to Sandy Hollow. It was the area where Lafayette himself was wounded, more of kind of fighting there, and on back towards Dilworth Town, and finally pushed back to Chester that evening. That, and again, it was a loss. We did fight enough. We went back and forth several times on Sandy Hollow, and that's where really a lot of people say that was the best part for Americans, because you spent a couple hours there and really kind of held off the British Army. A lot of people say, well, we now know we can kind of at least hold our own a little bit, and that carried over to Valley Forge, and that was probably the best thing that came out of. Later that night, there was a famous report back to the Continental Congress by Washington. He didn't actually write it, but he signed it, saying that put up a good fight, enemy has a field, but we're still intact. And of course, the Continental Congress read it, and that ended their time in Philadelphia. Mike served in New York for the winter. Washington uh, really was more worried at that point about protecting North and the places where it made the ammunition and the from munitions and the forges as much as Philadelphia. So if you take a look, he kind of really pulled up that way to protect them. The road was open to Philadelphia. There's still another chance at Germantown to stop them. And actually, it was a pretty good plan. Fog rolled in again. A lot of friendly fire, and then Philadelphia was really secure for the British at that point. And then we kind of lead into Valley Forge. We had the Paoli Massacre, the Battle of Paoli. And a couple weeks after Brandywine, you had the Battle of the Cro Cro Clouds, which of course was not a battle because no shots were fired near it. Immaculata, a big rainstorm, all the powder. So you still had some more movements before you got to Valley Forge. And you had the Continental, you had the Congress back at York. And actually that's where Washington wanted to be, back there. But he was pretty much told that would show a sign of weakness. You stay up towards Philadelphia. So you'd be that close to the British Army. And it kind of played out from there. Um, I always thought that the British, almost, they did almost, oh, the, the unit that I mentioned, the unit on the right that got lost in the woods, when it came in the clear, it was right on the flank of General Wayne and it helped weaken Wayne's defense, would allow the crossing a lot easier if night pass and coming across. So even when the British did something wrong, it really ended up, it was almost a complete British victory. But they did one thing really wrong. They should never have been here. <laughs> they should have been up more. Because within a couple of weeks, Burgoyne loses his whole army at Saratoga. So the second you know, panel's plan was really what the British should have done and not that first plan. So that's you know, kind of the story, real quick, of the Battle of the Brandywine. That you know, was the largest land engagement. It, you know, it was important for many different reasons, and the loss indeed, you know, we lost Philadelphia, but, you know, we kept on going, and Washington, again, did what he was, did a lot, he, you know, he kept the army intact so they could you know, keep fighting another day.